this is Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville, Ohio, USA. And it is my great pleasure to take part in this Advent pilgrimage as we journey through the genealogy of our Lord, looking at his uh, illustrious and sometimes scandalous ancestors. But today we're looking at the figure of Noah. Now, everybody knows the story of Noah and the ark and the flood and all the animals and uh, various uh, Noah paraphernalia and uh, stuffed animals and stuffed arks and so on. And, and storybooks are a staple of children's literature and the way that we raise our children in the faith at a certain age. We like to give them maybe a play arc, etc. So the question is, is Noah nothing but a children's story, or should we take him seriously as a person of history? Well, I think the easiest way to answer this is to go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, where, in its overview of Scripture, in the early paragraphs, takes Noah seriously and his covenant seriously, and says that the covenant of Noah is still in force. Also in the Gospels, Noah is listed as an ancestor of our Lord in Luke 3, uh, verse 36. And we know our Lord was flesh and blood. In fact, we consume his flesh and blood uh, every time we receive the Eucharist. So his ancestors then could not be merely mythical figures. So yes, we should take Noah seriously as a person. You might say, well, where is the evidence for a worldwide flood. And my first thought would be, maybe we're standing on it because most of the continents are covered with up to two miles of water deposited sediment. Have we ever really thought about that? Well, you know, I know the radiometric dating uh, it gives uh, dates that are too old and all that kind of stuff. So we'll leave that discussion to another time. But suffice it to say for now, should we take Noah as a serious figure? Indeed we should. So, Noah is remembered in the church's tradition and in the scriptures as a man of righteousness, righteous in his own generation, even as a preacher of righteousness who uh, spoke and proclaimed God's word to his contemporary generation, urging them to repent and to turn to God, uh, unfortunately without success. Uh, he only managed to save himself and his own family. Uh, that should be a lesson to us, even when we're great saints. Sometimes all we are able to save is those immediately around us. But I want to look at a perspective on Noah that perhaps uh, you have not seen before. Let's go back to uh, the book of Genesis and look at what actually provokes the flood. And we find that in Genesis chapter 6, which says that when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. What this is telling us is, first of all, that the sons of God who, following St. Augustine, we understand to be the covenant line through Adam's son Seth, we're intermarrying with the daughters of men, who again, St. Augustine uh, tells us, are the line of Cain, who were outside of the covenant and had rebelled against God. And so we have the young men from the community of faith marrying outside the community of faith, women of a different line of descent uh, who do not hold to the covenant. This would be like young men marrying outside the church, so to speak. Not only are they marrying outside the community of faith, but they are practicing polygamy, multiple wives. That's why it says they married as any as they chose. Excuse me. They took as their wives any as they chose. This translation says that means as many as they wanted. So this is talking to us about the growth of rampant polygamy in early human society. Polygamy is a great distortion because marriage is an icon of the Holy Trinity the faithful love between two persons whose love becomes personalized in a third person, the child that comes from the marital union. That is how marriage images the Holy Trinity. And so marriage needs to be faithful and it needs to be exclusive and it needs to be monogamous to represent the faithful love that circulates among the persons of the Trinity. 
And God has placed marriage as a natural icon in human society that, that, that images God's own nature. And that's why movements of evil always attack marriage and try to distort sexuality and remove that, uh, that faithfulness, that ex- exclusivity, and that lifelong bond that characterizes marriage in order to distort the image of God in reality. Well, polygamy distorts the image of God because it removes that balance between husband and wife that reflects the balance and the love and the reciprocity of love between the persons of the Trinity. And uh, the husband has many women and is not fully and exclusively uh, given himself to any one of them, etc. And another problem with polygamy is it produces more sons for a man, for a father, than he can properly guide and raise and form. And that's exactly what we see in this passage of Genesis. The, um, the sons that are born to these unions are called these Nephilim, these fallen ones is what that means in Hebrew. And they were mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. It says in verse 4, really men of notoriety would be a better translation because uh, these many sons born in these polygamous unions produced these wild, uh, undisciplined young men who ran rampant in society and increased the spread of evil, just as we see in our own society how fatherlessness is such a huge problem that most men who are incarcerated uh, did not have a father present in their life, didn't have a good relationship or any relationship oftentimes with their father. And so, so many of our contemporary social pathologies are caused by improper fathering or absentee fathering or no fathering at all. And this is also the case at this early point in human history. And wickedness abounds because of this practice of polygamy and improper fathering to such a degree that God sorrowfully decides that the only course of action is to send the flood and cleanse the world and, as it were, press reboot on the whole uh, cosmic system and begin human history once more. But there is this righteous man, this man Noah, and God chooses, chooses Noah out to be a kind of new Adam to restart the human race. And it's interesting with Noah Noah is monogamous. Noah has only one wife. And Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, are also monogamous. They each only have one wife. And the scriptures tell us explicitly that only eight persons go on the ark, one man and his wife, for Noah and the three sons. And all the animals that go on the ark are also monogamous, right? They go in two by two. This is very significant. And my, my eyes were open to this through the Dead Sea Scrolls because the Essenes who left us the scrolls noticed this and used this as an argument that God's intention for humankind is really for all the world was monogamy. So we see this contrast in Genesis between the sons of God who are marrying many women from the daughters of men, practicing polygamy, and society is going downhill rapidly because of them, and then righteous Noah and his sons who practice monogamy and all the animals in the ark with them practice monogamy. So what is this telling us? Monogamy is part of, monogamous marriage is part of the foundation of a righteous society. And without monogamous, faithful, loving, lifelong marital unions that produce children who are stable and worship God, society uh, descends into rampant uh, chaos. So uh, this is uh, an interesting perspective on Noah. And of course, righteous Noah is the forefather of our Lord through many generations. So now we want to bring this around to Advent and to Christmas and ask the question, well, what is this, you know, Noah's example of faithfulness and marriage, what does it have to do with Advent and Christmas? Well, there's many marital themes in uh, Advent and Christmas. Let's start with the figure of John the Baptist, for example. Uh, John the Baptist was a great defender of faithful monogamous marriage. In fact, as you'll probably remember, what was it that John the Baptist was killed for? Why was he persecuted and beheaded by the king? Why? It's because he was speaking out against uh, divorce and remarriage because uh, the Herod in power at that time had uh, divorced his own wife 
and then married uh, his brother's wife uh, after she divorced him. So they were both divorcees who had married each other, and John the Baptist criticized that and said, you should be faithful to your first spouse, and it's not right for you to have your brother's wife. And for that, he lost his head. So we see this again and again in the history of the church. Thomas More is almost a perfect uh, uh, recapitulation of John the Baptist, uh, even down to wearing a hairy garment, right? We found out after his death that Thomas More was wearing a hair shirt underneath uh, his uh, luxurious robes. So um, Thomas More, likewise, defending marriage and was beheaded for it. So it's very unpopular in many times and places in human history to defend the truth about marriage, that it's a lifelong commitment between one man and one woman. John the Baptist did that. He dominates the second and third weeks of Advent in the gospel readings for those weeks. Uh, we should remember him as a great hero of marriage. But, of course, there's another holy marriage in Advent and Christmas, and that's the holy marriage of Joseph and Mary, uh, which was completely chaste, as we know. That's why we call St. Joseph the most chaste spouse. And the beauty of the marriage, which was a true and valid marriage between Joseph and and the Blessed Mother, the beauty of that marriage is it shows us that love does not need to rely on physical attraction to be strong and pure and vibrant and affectionate and lifelong. So St. Joseph and the Blessed Mother give us an example of a marriage that never involved the, that physical union or the physical attraction, but was wholly loving and affectionate and joyful and led to beautiful things, uh, obviously, uh, for the church and became uh, the basis for the home in Nazareth in which our Lord himself was raised and learned to pray and learned to read the scriptures, uh, etc. So we have the holy marriage of St. Joseph and the Blessed Mother, but then there's another marital aspect to uh, the season of Advent and Christmas. And this is an interesting little liturgical trivia. The Song of Songs uh, is only read in the regular readings of the liturgical year once in the whole annual cycle. And do you know when that is? It's actually around December 21st or 22nd, right in there. I should uh, check and make sure, but it's right a few days before uh, Christmas Eve. And we read from Song of Songs chapter 2. Uh, which describes the young man who is the bridegroom in the Song of Songs bounding down out of the hills to come and invite the bride to uh, run away with him off to their honeymoon, as it were. And like, why do we read this very romantic poetry from the most romantic book of the Bible about marriage and the joys of marriage and, and falling in love and so on? Why do we read that right before Christmas Eve and the birth of this little baby in the manger and so on? And the answer is because the church fathers saw Jesus as a marriage in himself. Jesus as a person is a marriage of human nature with divine nature. The two become one flesh in one person. And that's the analogy to marriage. Two natures united in one person, just as in marriage, two persons are united and become, in a sense, uh, one flesh or a unity. So Christmas is the great marriage of God and man in the person of Jesus Christ. And that speaks to us of the profoundness of God's love for us. His love is not simply the love of an affectionate master or a kindly boss. The love of God for us is as intimate as the love of a spouse who comes down to join his body to ours. And we renew that every time we participate in the Eucharist. Every Eucharist is a celebration of Christmas, in a sense, the joining of human and divine. Every Eucharist is also a marriage, our union with Jesus Christ, our bridegroom. This has been Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville. Enjoy your Advent pilgrimage.